And so I just want to ask this question, um, what is it that makes you mad? Uh, I'd say there's probably several things that make you mad, but there's also a group of you that are probably responding like I used to, which is, I don't get mad, I get frustrated. I have control of my emotions. Listen, I used to think I didn't have anger issues, and then the Holy Spirit and other people, like the Holy Spirit used people to show me I actually have anger issues. My issue is that I just internalize it. So some people like express it faster. I just let it fester and then express it. Both are bad. I got issues. We all got issues. What is it that makes you mad or frustrated, however you want to frame it? Maybe it's, and, and let me just ask this before we get to specific. What is it that makes you mad like on a, on a Wednesday afternoon or a Thursday evening? Or, or maybe it's like last night, we're driving home from a wedding, and we can see exit 25. If you're not from here, that, if you're watching online from somewhere else, it's like an exit to get to Cleveland. We can literally see the sign. I'm not good with distance. Maybe like 0.3 miles, 0.2 miles from it. And guess what happens? Traffic. Like, it's right there. And we're stopping traffic. I'm like, seriously? Like, I can sit and I'm like, how close do we need to be before I can use the shoulder? I mean, this is a real question. <laughs> The people in front of me start using it, and I'm like, let's just follow the leader, you know. <laughs> but what is it that makes you mad? Maybe it's some form of interruption. Is there anybody like me that gets frustrated when you get interrupted? Anybody? Am I the only one? Do you, are you guys like, great, you never get mad? I'm, you know, some of you are like, yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, yes, okay, I mean, there's, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Something makes us mad. There's things that push all of our buttons at work, at home, in every environment we're in. So have you ever stopped to consider what makes Jesus mad? Now, now, depending on the version of Jesus you were handed, you may think, well, he like never ever gets mad or man, he's just angry all the time. Uh, we're actually good, just going to see what the Bible says about it rather than what we've been told about Jesus. But there are certain things that make Jesus mad. And so what we want to do today is explore that. We're going to explore what exactly is it that, that angers Jesus to ask this question, how do we not make him mad? Now, I want to qualify that by saying, I don't mean how do we walk around on eggshells like some of us have to do with people in authority over us and just try not to make them mad. I'm not talking about that. that that's not the type of God that we either serve or invited to serve if you don't follow Jesus. Well, we're talking about the fact that if Jesus is our king, so every single one of us who follows Jesus, every one of you who will follow Jesus, he's our king. So if he's our king, we should be aligned with him we should not be so misaligned that we're actually making him mad. So that's what we're talking about. Not walking around on eggshells, but just living a life where we're saying, Jesus, you're my king, you're my leader, so I just want to please you, I'm going to honor you rather than frustrating you. And so to explore this, we're going to be in Mark chapter 11, if you want to join me in your Bible or Bible app. Mark is an eyewitness account from Peter. You're like, well, why is it named Mark? Because Mark wrote it down. And Peter had him write everything down, but Peter was really the leader of Jesus' disciples, so we're getting an eyewitness account of things that happened. Peter had an anger issue, so I think he was probably pretty happy to uh, know that Jesus got angry as well. And so as we're looking at this passage, here's a little bit of context. Jesus is just, he's just rode into Jerusalem, and everybody's worshiping, and everybody's fired up. We call this Palm Sunday. We celebrate it the week before Easter. And so everybody's really excited, and, and if you just smell the air, freedom is in the air, as is revolution. Because what they want Jesus to do is to ride in and get angry with Rome and overthrow the Roman Empire and set up the Jewish kingdom. That's what they want Jesus to do. So they're expecting some anger. What they find is that Jesus is angry at what most of them would probably consider the least likely place for him to get angry at. So, Mark chapter 11, first in verse 11, it says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. We start here, even though if you're looking in your Bible, there may be like a division there, and this looks like it's part of the previous section that was all added in. But we start here because sometimes in our anger, it's very impulsive and it's out of control. And we can come to a passage where Jesus gets angry and think we're justified to be impulsive and out of control. But what we need to understand is that Jesus actually comes in, observes the things that are going to make him angry, and then he doesn't do anything right away. He just goes home. Thought about that. So when he is angry, which we'll get to, it's calculated and controlled instead of impulsive and out of control. 
And something that my pastor, Dr. Jay McCluskey, taught me is that when we're studying Jesus, don't look only at directives, also look at practices, because he's our blueprint. So the practice of Jesus here is to see something that's going to frustrate him and make him mad. Instead of reacting right away, he pauses... He goes back and he observes, like the message says, that he looks around carefully, observes everything, the message paraphrase. Then he goes back, he prays, he reflects, and then he asks, what if we just made that our practice? What if when we felt those emotions starting to rise, instead of like, rah, and just unleashing on everybody, what if like Jesus, we stepped back, took it to our Father in prayer, gathered ourselves, and then came and expressed that emotion? I have a sneaking suspicion that our marriages, our relationships with our kids, our friendships, our relationships at work would be so much better if we just did this one thing. And so this is what Jesus does. And then it comes back, then he comes back the next morning. Verse 12 says, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. I like this because he's human. It reminds me, he's fully God, fully human. He's hungry. Some of you are hungry right now. That's okay. Just like Jesus right now. So seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf He went to find out if it had any fruit. But when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. And then he said to the tree, may no one ever ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. So what we see here, not only is Jesus hungry, but he's hangry. Anybody ever been hangry before? (laughs) And so, like I'm feeling a little bit better about myself and how I react to things. Like Jesus is hangry. But, But notice he says it, Loud enough for the disciples to hear. That's a hint. Maybe there's more going on. Then it says, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts. He began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Pause there. We'll read verse 17 in just a minute. So what Jesus does is he, he walks in, and on the walk, he sees this fig tree. It has leaves, but no figs, even though it's not the season for figs. He's like... Ah, you're done. Nobody's going to ever eat fruit from you again. And then he walks into the temple and he begins literally turning over tables. I'm not going to turn this over because it might damage the stage. Like if, if you've never turned over, this is a big deal to turn over a table. And he wasn't just like, Ooh, let me just gently lay this down. No, I mean, and think about it. There's like money on this, maybe even animals. I mean, there's all kinds of things on these tables. They're not just empty. I mean, this is a huge scene. So at first it looks like Jesus might be out of control. And honestly, Some of us like the version of Jesus that we just get at surface level. Because we'd like to just roll in and start cursing people that we don't like and people are doing things different than we want them done and we just want permission to just lose our minds and go off on people and we'd love to be able to do that in the name of Jesus, wouldn't we? We see Christians doing it way too often, don't we? But that's why we need to understand there's, there's more going on here it meets the eye. Jesus didn't just wake up on the wrong side of the bed and lose it. Remember, he had come in the night before. He observed all this. And now he's coming back, and he's doing something on purpose. In fact, this, this story is, is really like a, a sandwich version. The, the fig tree is going to come back into play. So I love sandwiches, so this analogy works for me. Um, but, but the fig tree, there's, there's two parts of it. It's like the bread, and the temple is like the peanut butter and jelly. Come on, somebody. You know, we're hungry. And so, or whatever your favorite sandwich is. And so, And what's happening is it's a dramatically acted out parable. Like Jesus is making a point. Notice he says the curse to the fig tree so that his disciples can can hear it. And he's turning over these tables and driving people out for a purpose. This is on purpose. It's intentional. He's making a point. In fact, we begin to see that point in verse 17. It says, and as he taught them, he's not out of control. This is a lesson. He's teaching them something. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So so what exactly is going on? Because if we're not familiar with the temple, we may not understand a lot of it. So what's happening is these guys, they're selling sacrifices. The temple was the center of the sacrificial system. You had to come and you had to bring an animal, a perfect animal, you sacrificed it to God and this is how you were forgiven and this is how you were made right with God. And so you either had to bring your own animal or you had to get to the temple and and buy it. Specifically, it mentions doves. 
because doves were the animal for the poor and those who didn't have enough money. And, and so what was often happening is these people that were selling doves were selling them at three times the market value. Extortion, in other words. Not only that, but if you brought your own animal and you've been traveling for days with your animal, a lot of times the priest would be like, mm, nope, not gonna work. Sorry, can't have that animal. Even though you save for that animal, you've taken great care of that animal, there might not be anything wrong with the animal, but the priest has all the powers. And the priest says no, and the priest says, here, you've gotta buy my animal for double the price. So now you're out the price of the animal that you brought and you're out double the price. I mean, you're just, they're extorting people. Not only are they extorting people, they're doing all of this in what's called the, the temple of the Gentiles. See, there were only certain areas of the temple the Gentiles or the nations were able to go into, but the nations were prevented from being able to worship because all of this extortion was happening in the one place that was supposed to be reserved for their worship. In other words, if we think about the temple, the temple was supposed to be a sign welcoming the nations to God, but it actually become a sign excluding the nations from God. The temple was supposed to be a place of justice, but it actually in this moment was a place of injustice. And because of that, Jesus gets angry. Because the temple was, and what was happening there and the religion that they were inviting people into is actually incongruent with the ways of God. And so Jesus is frustrated. We know this because when he says, hey, you have made this into a den of robbers, he's quoting from Jeremiah chapter seven and Isaiah 56. So here's a little bit of context of what Jesus is quoting. Jeremiah seven verse three says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, reform your ways and your actions. In other words, change. We would say repent. Repent means a change of mind that results in a change of action. Don't just keep going, but repent, reform, change. And I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. This was likely a part of their worship. That They were saying, hey, this is the temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord. Think of it like a chorus they would sing. Hey, we're singing the chorus, everything's fine. And Jesus like, no, no, it doesn't matter if you're singing the chorus if your hearts aren't reflecting the Father's heart. It doesn't matter the words that are coming out of your mouth if your actions are actually filled with anti-God actions. And so he goes on to say, if you really change your ways, again, repent, and your actions, and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the nations, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Sometimes we can get frustrated at God's anger. We can get mad at God being mad. <laughs> Why does he have the right to be mad? Here we see clearly, it mentions that, that God doesn't want us to harm ourselves. He doesn't want to trust in, us to trust in deceptive words that are worthless. So the reason Jesus is angry at sin is because sin hurts us and sin hurts others. And specifically, people were being hurt and excluded from even the presence of God and even knowing God because of their injustice and their sin and their extortion. Isaiah 56 picks up on this. He also quoted from Isaiah 56. Verse one says, maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand. My righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, who does what is right and maintains justice. The person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it and keeps their hands from doing any evil. In other words, blessed is the person who's actually following the ways of God. Verse three, let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. In other words, it was so easy, and, and oftentimes Israel found themselves in a place where they were saying, hey, this is only for us. We're God's chosen people. We didn't understand they were meant to be God's chosen people to be a light to the world, not somebody that was excluding the world. And that's what God's getting out here. He said, hey, don't let the foreigners say that I'm excluded, and then let no eunuch complain I am only a dry tree. We're not gonna get into all of what a eunuch is. You can talk about that in community group. But this is someone who is unable to, to have children, unable to reproduce, and it, and it was out of their, their hands. It was something that was done to them. And yet even though it was done to them, oftentimes they were excluded. They were looked down upon. 
They were saying, hey, you don't have any future because this has happened to you. And so this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who follow me, who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, who hold fast to my covenant. To them, I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. In other words, God's saying, hey, if somebody tells you you don't have a future, God says, I've got a future that's better than you can imagine. That's a word that goes down for us today. And then foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord and to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So if you put all this together, it raises a question. If God's house is not welcoming the nations, is it really God's house? It's one of the points Jesus is making. And if we look at this sandwich of the fig tree in the temple, here's one of the big ideas, not the biggest idea, idea today. It's possible to look fruitful from a distance, but be fruitless upon a closer look. It's possible to look fruitful from a distance. That fig tree, it's got leaves. It looks like it's fruitful. The temple, if you just walked up on the temple, it's busy. It's bustling. There's all kinds of things going on. It looks fruitful. It looks godly. It's possible to look fruitful from a distance, but actually be fruitless upon a closer inspection. And here's the warning. Let's not be fruitless. Let's be the kind of church and the kind of people that please God rather than angering Jesus. And if we're going to do that, we have to understand that the nations are on God's heart, and they must not only be on God's heart, but we must be acting out what is on God's heart. In other words, every Jesus follower has a global role. Feel that, internalize that. Every Jesus follower has a global role. Notice, I did not say every Jesus follower has to go. In fact, we're going to talk about three different ways that you can step into your global role in just a little bit. But every single Jesus follower should have a global role. Because essentially, here's what Jesus did in Mark chapter 11. He shut down church. I mean, this was their way to worship. He said, nobody's worshiping today. Until you begin to worship in a way that welcomes the nations to me. Until you begin to worship in a way that is not flooded with injustice and extortion instead of welcoming people and being generous to them. So this is change your worship so we can restart church. <laughs> and so let's not get to the point where Jesus has to shut us down, has to say, I'm angry and I'm mad. Let's be the type of church and people who actually have a global impact. Because what Jesus makes clear, what the Old Testament makes clear is that this is the way of Jesus. In fact, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22, if we go back just a little bit more in Isaiah, and this is just a sample. This is all throughout scripture. It says, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. God's heart is for people from every tribe and every nation to find him, follow him, and be saved through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And if we are not actively engaged with the nations, here's the reality, we are in sin. We're not following the ways of Jesus. So I drew some pictures to help us. And I'm not an artist, okay? These are gonna be on the screen for you. Um, <laughs> like that. I knew in the back you couldn't see it, so trying to help you guys out. All right, so, uh, you know, drew some pictures today. It's fun to draw pictures. So this represents you, we're happy, okay? I gave you the benefit of the doubt, all right? Things are going well. Um, anybody wanna guess what this is? Earth, oh man, I'm really good actually. I'm feeling better about my artistic skills here. All right, so um, we've got us and we've got the world and what this represents is that there is zero actual connection between us and the nations. And so my question is, is this you? Is this how you're living? If you're honest with yourselves, are you engaged in any way in taking the gospel to the nations? Before we go on, we need to understand this. If you're not a Jew, we're the nations. So the only reason we're here is because Jesus, or Jesus' followers received his rebuke and actually lived this out and took the gospel to the nations. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. 
to praise Jesus that people did what he said, may we do the same. But maybe this is where you're at, and this honestly represents sin. If there's no connection between us and the nations, we're not following the ways of Jesus. Maybe, though, this is how you were living, picture number two. Notice now there's a dotted line. Perhaps you're familiar with an org chart. If not, I'm so sorry. I hope to not bore you just to keep it simple. There's this thing called a, a dotted line reporting system and a solid line reporting system. And a dotted line reporting system, it's like you, you kind of report to this person, but it's a little different and, you know, it's not super strong. And honestly, that's how some of us are with the nations. When it comes to us and taking the gospel to the nations, there's like maybe a correlation. Like we might do something every once in a while. We might like give once or, or go once or pray a couple times, but there's no consistent engagement with the nation. So, so here's what Jesus wants. He wants a solid line correlation from us to the nations for there to be a consistent way that we are involved in taking the gospel to the nations. Jesus followers, this is God's will for us. If you don't follow Jesus and you choose to follow him, this is God's will for all of his children. And this is how we please King Jesus instead of angering King Jesus. So what does it look like for us to have this solid line correlation? Here's three simple things. We lift, we send, and we go. And in fact, you're like, where is that? What's well, on the screen? It's also in this wonderful brochure that Jade, J Jade is awesome. She's our Connect and Serve director. Yes, thank you, Jade, you're incredible. She leads all of our global efforts, and she put this together, and literally on the back, lift, send, go. This is how we make sure that there is a solid line, a direct connection, a direct way that we are consistently, not just once a year, we're consistently engaging the nations. So there's the three ways to do that. Lift, what does that mean? It means we pray. We're gonna talk about the power of prayer in just a few moments. Let's not underestimate that. Jesus has something to say about it as we end this passage in just a few minutes. Here's the thing. Every single one of us should be doing that. If you follow Jesus, there is zero excuse for us not praying for someone who's taking the nation, taking the gospel of the nations globally. Why is there zero excuse? Because if you open this wonderful brochure, we have individual partners, we have organizational partners. Like all you have to do is email them, go to their website, and you can find out information about what God's doing at an orphanage in Malawi, what God's doing in the Sahara Desert, what God's doing in Amsterdam, what God's doing in different places, and you can get updates, and then you can pray specifically. That takes a step on our part. We've removed the excuse. All you need is right here. So that every single one of us who follow Jesus should be consistently, at the very least weekly, praying for at least one person, one organization who is serving people and taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Not only that, some of us can send. And just to be clear, we, we all should be doing the lift part. We all should be praying. These other two, optional, we gotta do at least one. Some of us are gonna be able to do all three. Hopefully for a lot of us at some point in our lives, we'll be able to do all three. But the other part is send. Well, like I know, like my parents, for example, are unable to physically get on a plane and go somewhere, but they have been senders for as long as I have been involved in God's global work. And they're so generous. And so you can be involved in sending. You're like, well, I don't have any money. Well, you could also just help somebody pack. I mean, this can get really practical. And like go to the store with them and be just kind to them. You can email them encouragement while they're there and and, and set up a FaceTime with them and just encourage them and, and be part of sending them. And then there is going, that you actually go. This is both short-term and long-term. To help us think about what we're doing as a church and how you can be involved in this, there's gonna be a 2024 global calendar. We talked about this last week, but just to let you know, this is what we're doing. This information is also in here. So if, if you're like, man, I feel like I need to go now, I need to go next year, then, then here's the information. Like, like next week, after 11.15, we're going to have an informational meeting for Romania. It's as simple as coming to this gathering, going to get some lunch, and coming back after that. And you're taking a step towards that if God is leading you to go. And honestly, if you have the ability to go, like I know it's not physically possible for some people, but if you have the ability at all, I think the best question is not should I, but why not? Maybe it's not this year. Maybe you gotta start saving. Maybe it's a decade from now. But, but why not at some point 
Go literally see, put your eyes on what God is doing globally. Again, I know it's not possible for everyone, but for those of us who it's possible for, what would it look like for us to begin to pursue this now? And, and here's the thing. If you're going to get a passport for one of these trips, you probably should stop listening to me and go and order it right now. It's going to take a while. I'm just saying. <laughs> but really, like, the best time to start thinking about going with Shepherd's Heart incredible partner working in Kenya with orphans there in May. The best part to think about Romania in March, Romania in July. The best time to think about going to Sandy Land at the end of February, early March. The best time to do it is right now. In fact, I'm really excited because for us as a family, this next year, Liam, our oldest, he's going to get to go with me to Romania, Lord willing, in that July trip. We've already got his passport. And, and my action today is, hey, let's go ahead and start saving for that and setting money aside Let's not wait until July. Let's, let's start getting ready now. So what is it that God's putting on your heart for next year? And what do you need to do today to start preparing for that? All of us should have some type of global impact. Just for those of you who are in your um, 20s and 30s, our, our founding pastor, Jamie Work, and just an incredible story sometime of how he and his late wife, how they retired and their retirement plan was to take the gospel to the Muslim world. Just incredible, his legacy. And since she passed, um, he just, he spends his time mobilizing now, works for the International Mission Board. And he told me about this new effort that the International Mission Board is doing. And just to mention this to you is there's 3,072 people groups that no one is engaging that they've identified. And what they're trying to do, in, in Jamie's words, is they're trying to find some 20 and 30 year olds to basically Indiana Jones it. To, to basically, they're, they're calling them explorers. I mean, that's what this talks about. Like, would you be willing to sacrifice a few years of your life and just go to explore? Because to get the gospel to these people, we got to find them. We got to make contact. We've got to begin to strategize. And so would you be part of saying, man, 3,072 people with zero access to the gospel is 3,072 people groups too much. And so maybe God's leading you to do that. Maybe you're a senior in college. And you're like, what am I going to do next year? And maybe this is it. And there's actually a few of these brochures. I just got this from Jamie this week that are back at the prayer corner. If, if you're interested at all in this, please go back. We want to pray for you. We'll get this to you. And there's all kinds of great information for you. So really the question is just how. How is it that we are going to be a part of engaging the nations? Because Jesus is really clear that to be fruitful, we must have a global impact. And so then he goes on in this story and it, ends like this. In verse 18, it says, the chief priest, the teachers of the law heard this, and they began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And we can be like, we would never do that. We would never respond to the teaching of Jesus like that. But yet some people, they'll say like, why, why are we going to the nations? We got work to do here. Until everybody's reached here, why would we spend our time and money and resources going to the nations? No, no, you're taking what's a both and and making it an either or. It's not a either or it's a both and we engage locally and we engage globally in fact they're both under Jade's leadership here because it's a both and and so my point is that it's very easy for us to get mad and start making excuses instead of just submitting to the way of Jesus and saying okay God what does it look like for me to be engaged in taking the gospel of the nations and then it says, when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Um, there's a picture from us walking in Romania. I loved our walks there. And this is just a view of the city. And it was just special time walking. And just using my imagination and reading the story, I'm like, what would that walk have been like? <laughs> like, think about that. In the morning, Jesus cursed the fig tree. He turned over tables. He made a big scene. And now you get it to walk home with Jesus. <laughs> like, did they talk to him? They'd be like... Jesus, do you want some iced tea? Like, like what? <laughs> but I think what God's showing me is, man, as we're walking through this, as we're working through this, will we just be abiding with Jesus? If we're just people of the word and prayer, he's gonna lead us to engage the nations. He's gonna show us what to do. Let's be people who just walk with him. And then it says in verse 20, in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you curse is withered. Peter reminds me of like a toddler at this point. He's like, ah, it worked, Jesus. Like we've seen you raise the dead, but that fig tree thing, that's wrong up there, you know. <laughs> I mean, he's so amazed that it worked. And, and I think if we look at what Jesus is saying, is he's saying, if we're fruitless, then what's our purpose? And God's judgment comes down on us. Because God's heart for the nations, and he's going to use somebody to reach the nations. 
So there's no reason we should have to have God's judgment. There's no reason for us to be fruitless. He's shown us a way. There's practical tools literally in your hands to be fruitful and engage the nations. And then about that prayer thing, Jesus says this in verse 22, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their hearts, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Interesting where Jesus goes here. (laughs) But geographically, remember, they're, they're entering the city again. And Jesus says, just pronounced judgment on the temple and said, hey, everything that's happening at the temple that looks so fruitful is actually fruitless. And the temple sits on a mountain. So we're looking at this mountain and Jesus says, hey, have faith in God. If you say to this mountain, go in the sea, then it's gonna go in the sea. And here's what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying God is a vending machine. If we walk out of here and say, God, give me a new car. There's gonna be one in the parking lot. Okay, that's not gonna happen to you. But here's what he's saying. It's when we, we begin to align ourselves with the ways of the kingdom of God. A kingdom of God that is always reaching farther and farther into the nations. The kingdom of God that is a kingdom of justice and generosity. When we align our ways with the kingdom of God, then God moves on our behalf. And they could have very easily been intimidated by like, Jesus, you just went up against like the religious system, like all the people. Jesus, do you know what you're gonna do? He said, yeah, I'm gonna get killed in a few days. Like, Like it's costing me my life because the way of my kingdom is vastly different than the way of their kingdom and what they want. But what Jesus would also tell them is, I'm not gonna stay dead. I'm gonna rise from the dead. So as we engage the nations, it's hard. It's gonna be difficult. It can feel impossible at times. We may get criticized. You may say, well, is it even worth it? Man, it's worth it. And we have the power of God backing us. And that's why he says, access my power through prayer. So so why are we praying for the international persecuted church today at five o'clock? Because God moves when we pray. And we're inviting him. We're saying, God, move in me. In other words, awaken more of a burden for me. Destroy the apathy in my heart for the nations. Destroy the apathy in my heart for the fact that there are people, as we're gathering to just worship freely, that are literally being killed in the name of Jesus. Destroy the apathy and replace it with a burden, Jesus. And then here's a prayer we could all pray in Mark chapter 13. This is a prayer God put on my heart. This is not on the screen, but I'm going to be praying this for the global persecuted church tonight. Jesus is talking about their persecution in verse 11, and he says, guys, know this. When you're arrested, when you're put to trial, don't worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. So something I'm praying, and I'm going to be praying tonight, is when when our brothers and sisters all over the world, when they're persecuted, Jesus, in that moment, Holy Spirit, would you give them the exact words to say? Just like you promised, just like you did for your followers, just like happened in the book of Acts. And we can be a part of his power being displayed because here's the fact. Often where the church is persecuted the most, it's also flourishing the most. In the midst of such evil, light is shining and light will win. So let's pray for that. Let's pray for our friends who are suffering because there is great power when we pray. And then Jesus ends with this. And public worship is gonna come up as I read this last verse. They say, he says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. So your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. It may seem like, why do we get to forgiveness at this point? I think Jesus is saying, hey, as we pray, as we engage the nations, we've gotta set aside all of our agendas, all of our bitterness, all of our unforgiveness to simply follow the ways of the Father. And specifically with the question of what made Jesus mad as he got mad at the nations being excluded, as he was frustrated at injustice. I think Jesus is saying, until we're willing to forgive the people doing injustice, until we're willing to forgive the people that are actually excluding the nations, we're not fully ready to carry out his kingdom. In other words, let's not come out of here high and mighty and we're for the nations and all of you that aren't, you're just sinners. No, that is not the way of Jesus we forgive just as Jesus has forgiven us as we take his posture and we take his heart and he will use us to go to the nations and he will use us to impact the world so these guys are going to lead us in a couple songs 
And this is just an opportunity for us to respond. Maybe this is really, really hard for you. And like, I wasn't raised like this. I wasn't taught to think like this. I didn't even realize this was in scripture and that I didn't see God's heart for the nations. Man, we'd love to pray for you. If you're in the green room, the lobby, if you just come on down to this prayer corner, we'd love to just surround you and pray for you and, and ask the power of God would do a work inside of you. If you're here and you don't follow Jesus and you realize how much he loves you, that he died and rose again, and you may go back to the prayer corner, we'd love to talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus. And for all of us, the question remains, what are we going to do to either maintain or to start having a direct engagement with the nations? So what are we gonna do? Jesus, you've put all these tools at our disposal, you've removed all the excuses, You've given us this incredible story through the fig tree and the temple. You've made your heart so clear. I just ask that you align us with your heart. That any specific excuse that we may have right now, that you would just move it, replace it with your truth. And you show every single one of us what it looks like to be a part of your global work. I just praise you for your work among the nations. Continue to show us how this little church in Cleveland, Tennessee could reach farther and farther and farther into lostness and do immeasurably more through us, Jesus.